I just have a little bit of housekeeping before we get on to the panel tonight. Um, so if you'll just bear with me for a minute. Um, I want to remind everybody that if you've got a cell phone, to put it into the silent mode so that you aren't the one that everybody looks at when it goes off in the middle of the uh, discussion tonight. Thank you so much for that. Um, also, I'd like to encourage you, if you're a Facebook person, we have a Facebook page, and if you enjoy or appreciate the program tonight or you have some kind of comment, we'd love it if you would friend us on Facebook and make some comments. It's one of the best ways that we can try to grow our audience. Obviously, we have a very full house tonight. We would love our problem to be that we need to find bigger venues to host our programs, and that will only happen by the people that come and enjoy our programs, telling other people how much they enjoyed them or how meaningful it was. And so we would appreciate your help with that. Um, the symposium uh, is uh, dedicated to providing year-round lifelong learning for our community through educational programs that are thought-provoking, diverse, and affordable. And uh, so we've been around since 1971 and going into our 46th season. We've added uh, several programs that are not in the brochure. They are on our website, and you'll be seeing them about. You'll be seeing uh, them in our email blast. But I just want to mention them to you. Um, on March 21st, here at the Donovan Pavilion, we just added a program called No Barriers with Eric Weinheimer. And Eric is the blind climber who went up Everest. Well, two years ago, he solo kayaked the Grand Canyon. He's got a book coming out this month. And he'll be here to talk about that as well as his other adventures. Uh, so that's a great addition. And then on April 6th, actually going to be at the Villar Center, Illuminating Life with Jeff Tabin and Timmy O'Neill. And Jeff Tabin is probably the foremost ophthalmologist in our country. And with his partner, Sandek Ruit, they've uh, organized and created the Himalayan Cataract Project. And their goal is to eradicate curable blindness in their lifetime. And they've set, out, set up clinics uh, in Nepal, Tibet, India, Bhutan, now they've got several in um, Africa, and they're doing an amazing job. So he's going to talk about that project, but he's also a world-class climber, as is uh, Timmy O'Neill. So it's going to be another great addition to our Unlimited Adventure series. And lastly, uh, on March 23rd, if you haven't already signed up, we're doing a, a celebration for our 45th year. We're just a few months behind on the celebration, but it's going to be a fundraiser for us. And it's going to be the kind of fundraiser where there's no fundraising except buying the ticket. There's going to be food, drink. We promise there won't be more than 15 minutes of discussion where we talk about the past, the present, and the future. There's no silent auction. There's no paddle raise. It's just come and dance and drink and have a great time with your friends and support the Vail Symposium. I hope you can join us for that. Um, and lastly, our next event next week, also here, um, is Physicians' Perspectives on Near-Death Experiences. Uh, it's part of our Consciousness series, and we've got three uh, amazing physicians, uh, Dr. Eben Alexander, Dr. Raymond Moody, and Dr. Mary Neal, all physicians who have had near-death experiences, and it's changed the way that they look at their practice and how they think about uh, medicine, and uh, it's going to be moderated. Um, Gary, who's the moderator? Karen Newell. So anyway, if you're, if you're interested in that, it's going to be another uh, terrific program. On to tonight's program. I want to thank um, some people that make this possible. We are a nonprofit organization, and we could not exist without the support of our donors and our sponsors. And uh, we thank all of our donors. We couldn't do it without them. And every gift matters. So if you aren't a part of our donor family, there's no time like the present to get involved. Uh, I also want to thank the Donovan Pavilion, the Town of Vale, the Vale Daily, Vail Resorts, Epic Promise, Alpine Bank, the Atlers at Vail, and Futurian Systems, who've provided our video tonight. And they've got some literature over there on the table if you'd like to find, more, find out more about what they do. And lastly, I want to thank uh, Sandy and Fred Pack, who are the underwriters for tonight's program. Could we give all of those people a round of applause? So tonight's program, Seven Billion Reasons to Reconcile Climate Change, Politics, and Human Behavior. And we've got an incredible panel, and our moderator is going to induce the, introduce them all. So I'd like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Mercedes Quesada Imbed. And uh, Mercedes is a professor at Colorado Mountain College. She's the discipline chair and program coordinator for the Bachelor of Arts in Sustainability Studies. She holds a master's in environmental history and a PhD in environmental studies and she teaches a wide range of classes uh, that span the social sciences, humanities, and natural sciences. 
and she believes that in our globalized world, sustainability has become the work of our time. Thus, an understanding of climate change, in particular, the need for an integrated climate justice ethic, centers deeply in her research and her teaching. And she's going to keep things flowing tonight. Uh, there will be time for a Q&A at the end of the night. I want to thank you all again for coming. Please be careful going home, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Hello, hello. Ooh, there we go. Okay, here we go. All right. I have to hold my neck a certain way with this particular microphone. Okay, so I'm just going to repeat the title of this particular event because it's quite, uh, quite profound. Seven billion reasons why we need to reconcile climate change, politics, and human behavior. Sounds quite compelling, huh? Here in our midst, we are extremely fortunate to have Dr. Kevin Trenberth, Pete Ogden and Dr. Kimberly Langmay to discuss climate science, national and international climate policy, and ways by which we may garner more local participation at the individual and community level in order to foster more sustainable behaviors. We're going to begin the evening. I want to kind of give you a little bit of a rundown of how it's going to flow tonight so you have an understanding of, of when you'll be able to chime in with your insightful questions. We're going to begin the evening with presentations from our panelists. Two are visiting and one is resident. We're going to start by getting grounded in the science, then bridging into the policy, and then we're going to focus on this valley's specific role in mitigating climate change. We're going to allow them to dialogue with one another after the presentations and answer a few questions that I'll have for them. Then at the close of that panelist discussion, we're going to invite questions from all of you in the audience. So let's get, starting by let's get started by introducing Dr. Kevin Trenberth. I had to call a little bit with your introduction. There was so, so, so much to be said about you, and there's just so many contributions that you have made to scientific knowledge and understanding. Dr. Trenberth is a distinguished senior scientist in the climate analysis section of climate and global dynamics at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. He is originally from New Zealand. He obtained his doctorate in science in meteorology in 1972 from MIT. He was a lead author of several reports within the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and shared the Nobel Peace Prize, which went to the IPCC. He has served on many scientific steering groups and committees, both nationally and internationally. He is the recipient of many awards, including the International Prize for Water and the Climate Communication Prize. Kevin has published over 500 scientific articles and papers over 60 books or book chapters, and over 250 refereed journal articles. Incredible. Kevin is a primary advocate for the need to develop a climate information system that is an imperative for adapt adaptation to climate change. His current research focuses mainly on the global energy and water cycles and how they're changing. He gives us the information we need in order to remain hopeful yet diligent in these important times. We are attentive to your presentation, Kevin. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mercedes. Ah, it's working. Mm. Yes. So I'm from NCAR, National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. How many of you have been to NCAR? I would encourage you to come. NCAR has three main campuses, but one of the main campuses is up on Table Mesa. It, it's like a very a big pink castle. It's worth seeing in its own right. But inside, there's a science exploratorium there where you can look at things relating to tornadoes and climate change, and it's a fun place to visit for kids. So uh, please, please come and see us. All right. So my role uh, this evening, can we have the slides, please? I'm going to stand out here so I can see what's on the screen, and uh, that way I can... Uh, get a little bit more vigorous as well. Uh, so, well, let's see, here we go. So my role is, is to give you the, the basic science 
The fact of the matter is that we have a lot of observations, we have a lot of physical understanding, the, the basic physical laws, you know, gravity works and things like that, and how it all hangs together, and I'm going to try and give that to you uh, tonight as a basis for all of the subsequent discussions, which I'm very interested in participating as well. So to start off with, you know, global warming is alive and well. But as I will suggest to you, there, there are some consequences for that, and the polar bear is one of the poster childs for that. So this is a, a summary, then, of, of the total problem. There are, there are symptoms that we can look at, at the planet today, and I'll run down some of these in, in more detail shortly. The planet's temperature is warming. Uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is increasing. It turns out uh, those two things we can show are related to one another and that the human activities are causal. So that's the diagnosis. The prognosis then is for more warming at rates that can be very disruptive, along with all of the other consequences that we'll talk about, and will cause strife. And the treatment then is referred to as mitigation, which really means reducing emissions, excuse me, and adaptation, which is planning for the consequences, and we're not doing enough of either of these things. So we'll talk about uh, these as we go along. So what's causing the warming? We are. Various activities like this. The emissions of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And so this is the carbon dioxide record, which was established at Mauna Loa by uh, Dave Keeling, uh, a friend and colleague of mine, uh, and uh, it was established in 1958, and you see a sawtooth character to this, which is the breathing in and out of the planet. So in the spring and in the summertime, there is a drawdown of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as the plants undergo photosynthesis and get green and take up carbon dioxide. And then in the fall and in the winter, uh, there is decay on the forest floor of the leaves and so on, and carbon dioxide goes back into the atmosphere. And that's a huge an annual cycle, and yet it's dwarfed by the increases in carbon dioxide. There is no doubt whatsoever that this increase is due to human activities. In fact, there are different ways we can check that by looking at the isotopic composition of the carbon dioxide, for instance, because fossil coal has uh, carbon, which has a different isotopic signature than if you, get, um, if you burn wood, for instance. And so the rates of increase of carbon dioxide are increasing over time. In spite of things like the Kyoto Protocol, which was designed to turn this down in the other direction. Now, a good reason for that in recent times is because of China is burning uh, a lot of coal in order to electrify their nation. Who can argue with the, the need to have for people in China to have a refrigerator? But it has consequences. And, uh, and the U.S. is responsible for more of this than anyone else. The overall carbon dioxide has, has increased by more than 40% um, since pre-industrial times, and more than half of that has occurred since 1980. So we'll show that in the, in the next slide, in fact, along with the temperature record. So this is the temperature record compiled by NOAA. As you go further back in time, it gets a bit more ragged. There's, there's a fewer observations. There are no observations in Antarctica prior to about 1958, uh, for instance. And you can see some ups and downs uh, in this. But also, uh, you can see this overall trend. And I put on here, uh, maybe you can see it faintly, this is, in this is in degrees Celsius here. This is in degrees Fahrenheit, so this is 1.7 degrees Fahrenheit at the top here for 2016, the warmest year on record. So here's the carbon dioxide record. Now I've taken out the annual cycle and extended it back in time using bubbles of air from uh, ice cores in Greenland and Antarctica, and we can analyze the composition of that and look at see what the pre-industrial carbon dioxide was, and the estimate is that it was around 280 parts per million by volume. So that's this dotted curve on here for carbon dioxide. And the pre-industrial temperatures are the dotted curve in black on here, uh, at this level here. Uh, the zero on here corresponds to the 20, 20th century average. 
Now, I've plotted these together with different scales on the right-hand side here uh, for carbon dioxide and temperature on the left to suggest that there's a relationship between them. Because we can prove unequivocally that, there's, that these are related to one another. Now, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in the climate system from year to year with El Nino events and so on. And as a result, the warmest year on record was 2016. 2015 was the second warmest year on record, and they beat out 2014, which was the previous warmest year. The warmest 12 months on record is September 2015 to August 2016. And you can see the value there, and so it's up around uh, above 1 degree Celsius, above the 20th century average, and one point, um, above 1.2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial values. And you may have heard that one of the goals is to keep this below 2 degrees Celsius, because by the time we get to 2 degrees Celsius, a lot of things that are happening today, all of the trees out here, farming around the, around the world and so on, is no longer viable where it currently is. So that's one of the goals under the Paris Agreement we'll talk about later. But there are some other consequences I want to talk about. This, these are the ones which are often not understood very well. So what happens if you have too much heat? In the human body, we sweat. And uh, with homes out here in, in Vail and in the West, we can use evaporative coolers to moisten the atmosphere and keep uh, things cooler through evaporative cooling. And this works very well for planet Earth because 70% of planet Earth is, the, is ocean. There's plenty of water around. But of course, in places where there isn't enough water, and this is often the case in the West, and it's been that way in California, where you have drought, then you end up with very high temperatures and the risk of wildfire goes up. Another example, you know, after there have been some showers of, of rain, the ground is wet and the sun comes out, the first thing that happens is that the puddles dry up. And then the temperature goes up. So moisture plays a very important role in air conditioning the planet. The evidence for the reality of climate change comes from many sources. This is one of the sources. Uh, these are maybe a little dated now, but there are many of these. Glaciers are generally retreating all around the world. We can look at the uh, snow cover and, and Arctic uh, sea ice. They're both uh, decreasing. The lowest value on record uh, for Arctic sea ice is in 2012. But you can see that uh, in September, um, the, the, the overall decrease is more than 40% in summertime, associated with the increases in temperature and the increases in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This is a, a new record that we have uh, we've, we've put out. In fact, the, the paper related to this will be published on Friday, and you will be able to see some news accounts related to that. But we've been able to reconstruct the ocean heat content. This is the global ocean heat content back to about 1960. Before here, back in here, it's a bit ragged, and we can't really rely on these values here. But there's an increase in the heat in the, in the ocean. And this establishes that indeed there's an energy imbalance at the top of the atmosphere because carbon dioxide acts as a blanket and it traps heat. And where does that heat go? Well, it turns out 92% of it goes into the ocean. And that's where the memory of the climate change is. The instantaneous effects of carbon dioxide are quite small, but they accumulate over time, and this is where they accumulate and they accumulate in the Arctic with the melting of Arctic sea ice and the melting of Greenland and so on. And so we can look at this, I won't go into this in any detail, but there was not much increase up until about 1980, and then we can look at it as a function of depth. And over time, you can see after about 1990, it starts to penetrate to deeper layers, uh, below uh, 700 meters in the ocean, below uh, 2,000 meters in the ocean. But this has consequences because it means the oceans are warmer. The sea temperatures are warmer. The air above the ocean is warmer and moister. So let's look at the moisture aspects in just a minute. Sea level is generally rising, but prior to 1992, we don't have very good estimates. Um, 
because we only have measurements at coastal stations and island states. After 1992, we launched uh, satellites with altimeters on them, and we can measure the ocean surface to millimeter accuracy. And this is the record after that. We get a global value every 16 days. That's what the dots are. And then there's an overall trend, and sea level is rising at a rate of 3.4 millimeters per year overall. And so during this period, sea level, global sea level, has gone up by more than three inches. So the rate over here, remember uh, your one foot ruler has 30 centimeters on it. So this is a bit more than a foot per century. But the likelihood is that this will go up even higher. And, um, and so this has consequences all around the world. So I want to talk a little bit more about these consequences with regard to the, to the role of water in the system. It turns out warmer air can hold more moisture. You use this on a daily basis when you use a hairdryer. Hairdryer works much better if it's warm, right? It dries, the, takes, the, takes the moisture out of your hair, or if you use a dryer to, to dry your clothes. Well, it's, this, if there's one number you want to take away from this, it's 4% per degree Fahrenheit. And with global warming, there's more heat, there's more drying, there's more evaporation, and there's more moisture in the atmosphere as a result. But that gets moved around by the weather systems. And so in places where it's dry, uh, it gets drier quicker. The drought is more intense. But in places where it's raining, it rains harder as a consequence. And we can document it quite well. Most of the, I don't know whether you've thought about this, and I don't think they teach it very well in high school, but most of the precipitation does not come from evaporation locally. It comes from quite large distances, maybe a thousand miles away in some cases. And it goes into the storms, and the storms are reaching out always. That's even, if, even on a sunny day, you know, suddenly there's some gusty wind. You say, what's going on here? And then you can see over in the distance, oh, there's a thunderstorm over there. That thunderstorm is reaching out to grab the available moisture and bring it into the storm, and then concentrate it and dump it down. And so if there's more moisture in the atmosphere, it means that it rains harder. And this is what is happening around the world. I want to spend a minute, though, since I'm in Vail, to talk a little bit about Colorado and the mountains and climate change. This is a, a nice uh, picture showing some of those. So we will still have winter. <coughs> there will still be snow and a ski season in the future. The strong seasons will continue. But the snow falls most heavily at temperatures just below freezing, somewhere around 30, 28 to 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And you've heard the expression, it's too cold to snow. And on very cold days, you get this light diamond dust, and you can, you can blow it, and it settles away. And you can't make snowmen or snowwomen uh, out of that uh, very cold, dry snow. Um, so more snow is actually a consequence of a warming climate as long as it doesn't warm above freezing. One of the other things that happens is that glaciers retreat. Uh, it, it tends to amplify the changes because you expose brown land or vegetation uh, instead of a white surface. And so this means that the changes that are occurring in Colorado are actually greater than in other parts of the United States. And this is true also in the Arctic, especially, where the greatest warming is occurring. But one of the prospects is that you can actually have more snow in midwinter because the, at the atmosphere can hold more moisture. We've seen some of that this year uh, with, some, with some really heavy snowfalls. Uh, the snow melt occurs sooner at each end, uh, and, and, uh, um, and so the, season, the snow season gets shorter, uh, there's, there's less snowpack, and then there's prospects for much drier conditions when you get to the summer. So then there's a greater risk of drought in the summertime and a greater risk of wildfire, and we're seeing more of that in Colorado uh, as time goes on. Uh, there's also an expansion of pests like the bark beetle associated with this. So this is uh, the overall picture of the changes in snow cover around the northern hemisphere. There is a, a decrease from, uh, from March uh, through to August, 
and there's an increase actually in the wintertime. This is the greater snowfalls that, that can occur with warmer temperatures. Um, what this means is that there are more changes in extremes, especially the extremes of the water cycle, uh, the, the droughts, uh, the heat waves, the wildfires, and there is more intense precipitation where it occurs, but in between times there can be longer dry spells. This is the nature of the climate change that's going on. And so there are major challenges for water managers, and water is a major concern for Colorado. This is the actual uh, temperature curve and the precipitation curves for the United States, for the 48 contiguous states. And so you can see that the warming here is a little greater than it is globally. Uh, there's also an increase in precipitation, but there's a lot of raggedness to this from, from year to year. Um, and let me give you a few highlights here. So back in the 1930s, we had the Dust Bowl era. It was very dry, a lot of droughts, but very high temperatures. These things tend to go together. In the summer half of the year, hot goes with dry. Um, and, and that gets reflected in the annual means, and the Dust Bowl was very much in that way. And so it was 2012, as it turns out. Um, I would characterize the precipitation this way, that there wasn't much change up until about 1970 to 1980. It varies a little bit with season, but after that there was a jump. And this jump is mainly east of the Rockies, uh, where it has gotten wetter by, on average, about 7%. And if, if it was like this in, in the region east of the Rockies, there would be a lot of places where farming goes on right now would be in, in serious trouble. And we don't really know quite why this happened. It's related probably to things like the changes in the sea temperatures in the, in the tropical Pacific related to El Nino, but uh, this is not something we can definitely associate with, with climate change. So here's 2012. 2012 is the warmest year on record for the continental U.S. 2016 was the second warmest, but it was very dry. There was widespread drought that cost over $75 billion dollars in, in, uh, in 2012, and that was the year when there were major wildfires in Colorado in several places. I think I've got those highlighted very shortly. This is, the, <clears throat> this is the overall map of the changes in the U.S., and you can see the biggest warming has been uh, in the West, and, uh, and Colorado is very much in the, re in the red spot. There's, there's almost a hole in the warming in the Southeast uh, for this particular period. And this is the change in the extreme precipitation events. They're much greater in the, in the, in the north and east, uh, but uh, when, it, when it rains, it rains harder, and we've got very good evidence for that. And that's happening around the world. So I thought I would just touch briefly on the recent extremes in the last two years uh, that are associated with not just global warming, but also the big El Nino event that occurred out in the tropical Pacific. And these are some of the extremes that we've seen uh, in the western U.S., all of the wildfires um, and, uh, and the drought uh, in Borneo and, and wildfires, the big fire up in uh, Fort McMurray in uh, Alberta, in, in Canada, uh, major drought in, in South Africa, and, uh, and just recently there was uh, tremendous uh, heat and many wildfires uh, in Australia with uh, temperatures uh, for the whole state of New South Wales, 111 degrees Fahrenheit. Incredible. Uh, there are also floods in various places around the world. Uh, some of these, I've, I've tended to highlight a few more in the U.S., uh, in South Carolina in October 2015, in Chennai, in India, uh, in, in Missouri in November, December 2015, three times normal rainfall. Uh, in Paraguay, uh, in Houston in April, these are the recent ones last year, in Louisiana in August, and then um, in uh, California. Uh, we've had uh, record um, rains and snows in, in parts of California, so that this, uh, this tree here, a uh, famous tree, toppled over. Oh. Um, and, you know, 2015 is the most active year for hurricanes and typhoons around the world. 
especially in the Pacific. I don't have time to go into that in, in any detail. A record-breaking hurricanes all over the world, including in the Southern Hemisphere. There's one there uh, for, um, for Fiji. And these are the projected changes uh, going into the future. I'm not going to dwell on those at all, other than to say that it's an extrapolation of what I've been talking to you about with higher temperatures, a greater risk of, of heat waves and wildfires, and, uh, and the projections here. This is, um, if you can see, you know, these numbers are six, eight degrees Fahrenheit warmer than today, um, and this is for the period um, centered around 2050. And then the precipitation changes. This is not the main thing you really want to look for. Uh, sorry, this is the protective change in the warmest temperatures, um, and, and, so, uh, and so those uh, are higher as well. And so I'm going to stop here, and we'll, we'll come back and, and talk about uh, the consequences of these things. But uh, this is uh, you know, a part of the setting for, for the debate that we'll have uh, a little bit later. And uh, these, uh, this is my contact information um, if, if you're interested. Um, so that's, that's my contribution. Keep on making note of the questions you're going to want to ask later. We're going to move to Pete Ogden next. And uh, you're gonna have, we're going to have our eyes and ears focused on Pete. What a pleasure it is to have someone with your exceptional expertise on the political components of climate change with us. Let me share a little bit about your background with the audience as well prior to proceeding with your presentation. Pete is originally from California and brings a wealth of experience to this panel. He is now one month into his new position with the UN Foundation. He's the chief strategist for the Foundation's work with the United Nations and its partners to combat climate change, promote sustainable energy solutions, and advance critical environmental priorities. His work will ensure that the benefits of climate action remain at the forefront of the global agenda. Pete has built an exceptional reputation on these issues, having most recently served as Senior Fellow for the International Energy and Climate Policy at the Center for, Envi for American Progress and Senior Advisor and Fellow at the Energy Policy Institute at the University of Chicago. He has served in the U.S. government in various roles, including in the White House as Senior Director for Energy and Climate Change on the Domestic Policy Council and as Director for International Climate Change and Environmental Policy on the National Security Council. Pete also served in the U.S. Department of State as Chief of Staff to the Special Envoy for Climate Change. He is centered on linking energy, climate, and environmental challenges while also advancing the broader agenda of sustainable economic growth, poverty eradication, and social equity. He brings hope to the largesse of those political discussions. You, we have your atten you have our attention, Pete. <laughs> Thanks, and I'm, I'm going to just say uh, some remarks building uh, on the impressive uh, presentation we heard, which really laid out the narrative and teed up very well as if we had it planned, a final slide that sort of put a fine point on the policy and political debate that um, I've been a part of uh, and I wanted to talk about tonight to help people begin to understand where we are, what, what the Paris Agreement means, what its prospects might be, uh, through my own experiences. Uh, when, and I think back to when I joined the Obama administration in the beginning of 2009, you know, it was, a, in many ways, it was a very hopeful time for climate politics. If you, you know, it was eight years ago, and yet both the Republican nominee for president and the Democratic nominee for president at the time, both supported comprehensive climate legislation to cap greenhouse gas emissions and ratchet them down over time. There was agreement. There was agreement in the Republican platform that greenhouse gases were a pollutant that needed to be controlled. Newt Gingrich and Nancy Pelosi sat on a couch together on television and did promotional ads saying we need climate solutions for America. This is eight years ago. Uh, and so when we came in, you had that sort of momentum at your back. 
due to a lot of the scientific work that had been done, including this, this groundbreaking IPCC work Kevin's been a part of, there was, a, there was a stronger scientific consensus than ever, also probably more fear than ever being injected into the debate. And so in some ways, it, was a, it felt like there was an exciting time to begin the process. From a practical matter, when the, when the president was sworn in, he had a 10-month window between swearing in and an enormously important international climate summit in Copenhagen. You don't set those dates yourself. He, that was set two years before by a previous, you know, previous administration. It was, it was a reflection of a global demand to try to find a new international agreement because the Kyoto Protocol had not, even though the United States had been core to negotiating it, had ultimately not been able to join it. Um, the, the, and, and neither John McCain nor uh, Barack Obama at the time supported the idea of trying to join the Kyoto Protocol. The fundamental problems were both, I think, at that point, political problems and policy challenges. The protocol had been uh, designed in a way that put legal obligations for reductions in greenhouse gas emissions on developed countries, did not put the si similar legal obligations to reduce emissions on any developing countries. Um, Congress, where in order for the US to join, would have needed two thirds majority to ratify the treaty, uh, sent a 97 to zero uh, resolution back to the administration saying, we do not like the terms of this agreement uh, and here are threshold concerns. Um, in any case, by 2009, there was a broader understanding that in fact, the emissions profiles of many large countries, the major emerging countries, had to be better accounted for than they were in the Kyoto Protocol. Um, the US is historically the largest emitter, uh, but China has quickly surpassed us. And in any case, the major emerging economies was where all of the growth of future emissions was happening. So you can, you can debate, and I'm not saying one, that there's a, I'm not trying to argue on the merits of it one way or another, but that was the political reality of the time, and that was the challenge that was faced. And so the United States sort of quickly set to work trying to build up a new climate diplomacy regime. Secretary Clinton established the first special envoy for climate. We never had a senior diplomat in the US government whose only job was to try to build an international climate arrangement. Um, and especially important vis-a-vis -vis China, uh, where we had never really tried to elevate that part of our relationship and make it a diplomatic priority. Um, the challenge, as you can imagine, is with these, when you're dealing with China on this, when you had already once negotiated an agreement, as we did in the Kyoto Protocol, everyone agreed to it, then the United States comes back later and says, guess what, we can't join. And now you're back there saying to them again, guess what, we need a new agreement, this one's gonna require more of you than the previous agreement, uh, trust us, we'll, we'll be part of it. The, the overall view was that the way, the, that, that approach wasn't gonna work again. What we needed was an approach that began and was anchored around domestic action that we could credibly take to the international community and say, this is really what we're prepared to do. Our politics are there, we can, we can and our policy is there. And that was the origin of so much attention internationally built around what was happening with the, what was then called the Waxman-Markey Bill, the House Bill, to make that greenhouse, that, that cap and trade system a reality. And so 2009, that was moving through Congress, it was passed the House, um, by the time we made it to the Copenhagen Conference, it wasn't law, but we were at a point where there was a credible argument to say we, we can in good faith um, put forth a target uh, that we have, we believe we will be able to achieve. Um, and we took the, 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 the target that was in the House legislation and that became the 2020 target that was set in Copenhagen. It was a 17% reduction beneath 2005 levels by 2020. Um, it was still a really challenging negotiation. The Copenhagen Accord did not yield the Paris Agreement. It didn't yield a, uh, uh, a framework that was going to be able to exist in perpetuity. It got us 
10 years. It got, it got us a set of commitments that countries would make for what they would do in 2020. Um, and so everyone left that meeting knew, knowing already that there was going to be more work to be done. Uh, and there was a great deal of dissatisfaction because it not only was it just a 10-year commitment period, but there wasn't a new internationally legally binding agreement like the Kyoto Protocol that the United States was going to take back to the, to the Senate and try to get ratified. Um, the situation got much harder shortly thereafter, where six months later, that 17% number that had been enshrined in the House legislation uh, sunk when the Senate scuttled its, its needed reciprocal bill on the, on the legislation. So it felt like deja vu all over again. We had gone on with a target. We made a commitment. We had thought we had, we had, thought we had fit corrected by having the domestic, a domestic legislation that could underpin it and we could execute, and it wasn't there. And the politics had changed a lot. I mean, by 2010, you had members for Congress running in campaign ads in which they were literally shooting at copies of the Waxman Markey Bill tied to a tree. So that's a long way from like the political consensus two years before where the nominee for, you know, for presidents for both sides was out there trumpeting this kind of climate, comprehensive climate legislation. Um, and the, the prospects, so there were, over the next couple of years, there were occasional attempts to try to get Congress to, to uh, pass legislation. The president um, essentially had to make a decision what to do about that. What, what do we do about this 17% target? And he decided very clearly that we were going we to own that target. That, there, what, that this, the important thing is building a new, the new Paris Agreement was we had to show that if a country set a target for itself, that it could show determination to meet it and that it would be meaningful. Uh, and that it wasn't sort of just arbitrary because it wasn't enshrined in international law. And so over the next few years, you saw this sort of a, this steady accumulation of domestic regulation around uh, methane emissions, around vehicle efficiency standards. Ultimately, the, uh, the first, um, with the Clean Power Plan, the first ever set of regulations that cover greenhouse gas pollution in, in, in our power sector um, that were methodically moving us towards the 17% goal and, um, and bringing that one very much in, in, into sight. China, meanwhile, was also going through a, a, a kind of its own political transformation when it comes to climate change. The, the pollution is an issue, is a political issue in their country just sort of skyrocketed. And we've, we've all seen the pictures of, of, of the choked cities and, and, you know, the, and, and, the, and, the, and the, water, the waterways um, with, that, are, that have become toxic. And it became a political issue there that they were willing to grapple with. Um, and that the idea that there were solutions to their environmental, local environmental problems that really dovetailed with broader climate solutions suddenly move them into a, into a different posture. And their interest and their receptivity to what had been a sustained push by the United States to try to get China, to try to make this an important part of our relationship, knowing that at the end of the day, the only way to get the political support globally for this was to get a deal with, the, with China and other major economies engaged. And you, you sort of saw that, that momentum build over the following years. And finally, we ended up with the US and China really far out in front when it came time to the Paris Agreement came time. Um, both countries set bold targets for themselves beyond the Copenhagen targets for the first time. Um, and that sort of paved the way for other countries to move into that space as well. And you know, the ultimate agreement that came out in Paris, it's, it's sort of interesting to me because in, in many ways, while people were very dissatisfied and, and, and a lot of people were, were you know, the, the Copenhagen agreement had not 
met everyone's expectations, oh, you see a lot of the same elements of it. You saw an agreement in which countries, all of the major countries in the world, set targets for themselves. You saw a system in which um, a two-degree target was affirmed, that there's a global two-degree target, and in which every five years there's a process for ratcheting those targets down in accordance with the science. The first, the, as Kevin can tell better than anybody, the first set of targets will not get us to two degrees. Whether or not, how, many, how much more steeply those targets have to decline in subsequent years, you can tell me better than, I, than, than anyone else. But it set in process a system in which the United States could partake. We're part of that agreement. We're full participants, um, as, is the, as is China, as is, every, as is 170 other countries who have agreed to it, um, on an ever-ratcheting process that, hopefully underpinned by other um, developments, will be able to drive us to that, to that agreement. Now, nothing is set in stone. An agreement's an agreement, and it can be canceled. And that's what Donald Trump has promised to do. Um, we will have to see what that, what that really means in practice. Um, there's lots of different ways that you could imagine going forward on the Paris Agreement, ranging from, you know, from actually trying to meet your international commitments in it, to staying in, but not really doing the things that it would take to really get to where you need to go, just sort of drifting along, hoping that maybe the subnational actions of states and, and businesses and local communities will be enough to keep, you know, to maybe, maybe you happen to be somewhere in the ballpark where you want to be at the end. Two, more aggressively trying to lower your target, if that's even acceptable under the terms of the agreement. Uh, and then finally, to actually try in the process of formally disengaging from it. Um, and I think sort of the, the, the it's, it's very much a question now. We don't really know um, what's going to happen. They haven't made any formal statements. But I think that there's an international architecture there that um, will resist uh, any single country trying to undo uh, the full agreement. And that's, um, that's, that's kind of the, that's, that's the predicament we face right now on the international level. So with that, I will pause, and uh, we can maybe continue this discussion in the Q&A. Keep making note of those good questions you've got. And let's continue with an introduction of our resident panelist, Dr. Kimberly Langmaid. I have the fortune of knowing Kim personally and academically, and let me share a bit about her accomplishments with you. Kim is a conscientious advocate for environmental and sustainability education. She is the founder of Walking Mountain Science Center and currently serves as its vice president and director of sustainability and stewardship programs. She was pivotal in the formation of the Bachelor of Arts program in Sustainability Studies at Colorado Mountain College and presently teaches a variety of classes in the program. She was the formal di former director of the graduate program at Teton Science Schools and has taught in the graduate program at Prescott College. She received her master's and PhD in Environmental Studies. Kim's own dissertation research at Antioch University centered on the lived experiences of field ecologists studying climate change in the American West. Her committed involvement to the birthplace, to her birthplace here in Eagle Valley, includes serving on the board of directors with Energy Smart Colorado, spearheading Actively Green, and certifying Vail as a sustainable destination. She has most recently been named as a Vail Town Council member and is co facilitating the Eagle County Climate Action Plan. She is a true local leader fostering hope and positive change here with us locally. The floor is yours, Kim. Thank Thanks for such a nice introduction, Mercedes. It's great to see so many of my friends here. I'm just going to give you a very brief overview of what we are doing locally. Uh, last year, uh, Eagle County Commissioners made uh, protecting our natural resources and taking action locally on climate change one of their strategic priorities and they contracted Walking Mountain Science Center to convene and facilitate a climate action plan for our Eagle County community. So it was my great honor and very re rewarding experience to bring together 30 stakeholders representing all of our local governments, uh, large businesses, schools, and nonprofits to 
create this plan about how we could work together as a community to take climate action and reduce our community-wide GHG emissions. So as Kevin mentioned, the science is clear. Things are happening in our mountain ecosystems, including winters getting warmer and shorter. We know uh, from some more local Colorado studies that we have lost 23 days of freezing temperatures uh, since before the 1980s, and we're predicted to get uh, quite a few more by the middle of the century. Summers are getting hotter and our ecosystems are changing. We've seen the, the impacts of the pine beetle all around us. So things are happening out there as we speak. Before we set out to create the Climate Action Plan, uh, Eagle County conducted an inventory of its current greenhouse gas emissions. And this was a study that was done using a specific protocol that many communities across the United States use. And this is just a little bit of a highlight from that greenhouse gas emission study. All of this information is available in the Climate Action Plan, which you can find online, and I'll show you the website at the end here. But just a couple highlights. Our total emissions by sectors here, we can see that the commercial and ener um, commercial industrial energy use, those are also large buildings that people live in and stay in, is 32%. That's the largest use. Residential building use is 28% of our emissions. On on-ground transportation vehicles is 27%, the landfill is 10%, and the smallest amount is aviation fuel sold at the airport here. And then uh, what is very striking here on the right is our emissions per capita compared to the country and the state. So the US average is about uh, 17 metric tons of CO2 equivalent. Colorado is a little bit higher than that. Um, maybe 17 and a half, and in Eagle County, we are almost at 25, more like uh, 24 metric tons of CO2 equivalent. And one of my colleagues who works at Eagle County, John Gitchell, who's here this evening, he likes to say one uh, metric ton CO2 equivalent is the, about the same amount as one of those large, big hot air balloons. So if you can imagine uh, 24 of those coming out of, of uh, you know, each person in Eagle County, that's quite a lot. That's a lot of balloons filling up the sky over the course of a year here. Yeah, they, so that's what, that's what makes it interesting here because of our resort economy, right? Because um, there a lot of, even though we are just counted the number of people who actually live in the county, uh, we actually absorb all of the energy that is used by our guests. Good point. And so we did a little forecasting of this data and we showed business as usual. If we don't do anything to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, it will just continue to go up um, as uh, population increases and so on and so forth. So that is uh, not what we want to see happen. And uh, yeah, it could almost double by the year 2050. <coughs> So the stakeholders were very clear. Why are we doing this work? It's because of our community values. It's the things we care about here, including our future generations. That's what's really motivating us to make sure that we can leave a great place for future generations to live. We set greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. We wanted to be in general alignment with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and what other many other communities across the country are doing. So we set that longer term goal of an 80% reduction by 2050 and then kind of worked our way backwards and set the goal of 25% by 2025, which we felt like would be really get us motivated and get going and be a meaningful uh, uh, scope of work that we could focus on. So we divided our work ahead into six different sectors. We came up with the education and outreach sector, the waste and landfill sector, commercial buildings, residential buildings. And this is really looking at our biggest, uh, lowest hanging fruit. The easiest stuff we can do is really related to energy efficiency here. We have some huge buildings, some older buildings, and we can do a lot just by improving our energy efficiency here. I would say that it needs to be one of the highest priorities right now. Transportation and mobility, we'd like to reduce our local emissions 10% by 2025. 
That's a little bit more difficult with I-70 running through here, but there's a lot that we can do locally in terms of improving our bus systems, doing uh, better design of our newer neighborhoods, and expanding use of electric vehicles. I myself got an electric bike and started commuting on that last summer, and it's been fantastic. It makes getting to work so much easier. And then focusing on our energy supply sector and working with our utility partners, Holy Cross Energy. We're lucky we have a co-op and they are very motivated to do what they can to increase uh, their portion of renewables. So there's a lot happening, uh, but we need to really ramp it up as we've heard uh, if we want to accomplish these goals. A few simple things. I wanted to leave you with a few simple things you can walk home with tonight and start doing. Um, be energy efficient at your home. If you haven't done a uh, change out of all your light bulbs to LEDs, please do that right away and you can get money back from Energy Smart Colorado at Walking Mountain Science Center. Uh, eat wisely, eat locally when you can, eat more veggies and fruits and not as much meat and dairy because they use more GHGs. Ride your bike, take the bus, so on and so forth. Re reduce waste, uh, reduce methane that is in, um, created at our landfill. So these are very simple things you do. You can do, we want to take a very practical and proactive approach uh, to climate solutions in our community and uh, looking forward to your involvement. So you can find a copy of the Climate Action Plan at Walking Mountains website. Just go to our main web page and go to uh, Climate Action Plan. And if you have any further questions beyond this evening, uh, you're welcome to email me at Walking Mountains. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of our panelists for those enlightening presentations. And I've got a couple of questions for them first, and then we'll open it up to everybody, okay? So the first question I have is actually for you, Kevin. And climate science, you know, as we're learning a little bit here, is a bit contentious. Some agree, some disagree. Could you tell us a little bit about what you see the role of the climate scientist as when it comes to influencing climate policy, when it comes to of dredging up those facts and presenting them. Are, 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 sci are climate scientists activists? Are they the neutral objective scientists that we have been told and through our scientific methods? How would you describe your role? Well, most climate scientists are actually quite conservative. They're not uh, uh, activists at all in the sense they're lobbying for political action. You know, the, the role of the scientist is to uh, deal with all of the observations, all of the tremendous amount of information that's available coming in on a daily basis for weather purposes and, and climate purposes, uh, distill it, analyze it into, into different products of different kinds. There are many uses for that on a daily basis. There are many uses around the country, whether it's a, a water user or a forestry manager or a farmer uh, and so on, on different, on, on different time scales. Um, we have a lot of understanding of, of how all of these different variables hang together. I described some of them, uh, you know, temperature versus precipitation. If it's wet, uh, you know, the temperature is not as high and, and so on. Uh, and, uh, and, and so we can put all of this together in the form of climate models. We can actually simulate uh, the last hundred years quite well. The only way we can do that is if we include the changes in the composition of the atmosphere, the increasing greenhouse gases uh, in the atmosphere, and uh, also the complexity of the, the changes in pollution and so on, which, which uh, when they're interacting with clouds, is, is perhaps still a somewhat unsolved problem. But we can do quite well on this now. And so the climate models then provide uh, what if projections for the future? We say, well, what if we keep increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? Then we expect that the climate would do this, the climate system will do this, and we can make projections for what the temperatures and the, the heat waves and the wildfires and, and so on are, and then the social scientists can come along and they play a role and say, well, here's the impacts of these on various sectors of society uh, uh, in, in, all, across, all across the board. And, uh, and then uh, the social scientists or a different branch of social science can come in and say, well, if these things are going to happen, there's a lot of what ifs that start to come in at this point, 
then these are the options we would have to deal with them. And so this is the scientific approach to dealing with all of these things. We ask a lot of what if questions. Uh, we say, if you do this, then this will happen. These are the options for dealing with them. These are the options for mitigating the problem in the first place, cutting down on emissions. These are the ways we can do that. There's a lot of econ economics involved in, in that kind of thing, the different fuels that are used and so on. And, uh, and the so-called adaptation to climate change, building resilience uh, to uh, extreme events, to the, to the risk of increasing risk of, uh, of flooding, for instance, uh, the increasing risk of wildfire. How do you mitigate that in various ways? And, and so all of these things are the appropriate role for scientists. But whether those things happen or not is the role for everybody, the role of policymakers. And so the approach that scientists have to all of this is to treat it as a scientific problem. This is the way the so-called Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change deals with this as well. We deal, we deal with all of these things and say, these are the options that are available, and you know, if we do this, we expect this, and these are the ways we might be able to deal with it. But whether that gets carried out or not is up to everybody, and in particular, it's up to the politicians. So that's the way we see this. There's a divide then as to which part of this problem is really debatable, which is the latter part. You know exactly what you do given this information, but for heaven's sakes, don't ignore the information and the evidence, which unfortunately far too many of the politicians in Washington and, and some of the new cabinet members are now doing. responsibility of the scientific intellectual when it comes to uh, the climate dialogue. Um, I've got a question for Pete now. You know, some other folks sometimes uh, in the world of international governance also take on the responsibility of climate change. The Pope's encyclical, the Laudato Si, which is subtitled Care for Our Common Home. Have you seen an impact of this document on the broader scientific and, and political dialogues taking place around climate process? I don't know if it's affected the science, but um, I think it came in a moment that was in the run-up to the Paris Agreement when there was this sort of broader recognition of uh, the opportunities that was being presented by this historical moment. and. Uh, I, you know, I don't think, I, I think it was important, I think it helped to build uh, animation among different constituencies, uh, among, beyond just, beyond just Catholics around the world. Frankly, the politics of this stuff, it's, it takes, it, it's bigger than just that one voice. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a very politically contentious issue. It often, where people stand on climate policy, is uh, is often very determined by just the use of the term climate, and it's become in political discourse to be a shorthand for a whole other set of beliefs, choices, lifestyle decisions. Uh, that if you strip away the word climate and you ask them about particular components, are you experiencing environmental changes in your community? Are you you know are you concerned about water and air quality and the, all the very issues that you're trying to get at through climate change, you get a very different response. I think it was notable to see uh, someone like the Pope be begin to bring those issues together. And I think to challenge a little bit some of those assumptions that come with the, that, that have been kind of politically attached to climate change. All right, let's see. I'm gonna send this one to Kevin and Pete for a minute together. Double question. You both talked a little bit about China and the idea of these emerging economies. And I'm curious how you respond when people forget a little bit about the historical trajectory of the United States when it comes to our coming into the power that we are, our use of fossil fuels, getting that far. What do you say to individuals that want to place the blame and want our emerging economies to be the flagships for renewable energies and 
really aggressive climate mitigation? You know, the, the air goes around the globe in about three weeks. We've seen that in the manned balloon flights that occurred. So the air that's over China one day is over the US about a week later, and a week later it's over Europe, something like that. We share the, the air. The air, the atmosphere is a global commons in that regard. China puts more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than any other nation now. You should be outraged. The Chinese are changing your atmosphere. Why aren't you outraged at that? But by the same token, the US has put more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than any other nation when you add it up. And the thing is, carbon dioxide has a long lifetime. And so the US is responsible for more of this problem than any other nation. Why aren't the Chinese outraged? They're, we're changing their climate, for heaven's sakes. And in fact, as, as Pete mentioned, there was a big transition. In 2007, I was involved in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and the Chinese were, government was very obdurate and opposed all of the wording in the IPCC uh, document uh, and tried to water it down as, as best they could. And there were a number of Chinese scientists who played quite a strong role in developing that document and the Chinese scientists and the government could not talk to one another. But this has changed, and part of it is because of air quality, but it's also the realization that China is greatly affected by droughts and floods, and they've had a number of these. They, they're affected by hurricanes, uh, typhoons they call them over there. And so they've, they've changed their, their policies in, in this regard. So why aren't we all outraged at each other in this, in this regard, and there's sort of an acceptance. We're all going down this road together towards some kind of disaster uh, uh, in future. This is where the Paris Agreement really came into, came into being, that we recognized this and, and, and made some, some real progress on that, and China has stepped up to become a leader, but I'm really concerned about whether the U.S. is going to continue to be a leader President Obama played a major role in, in forging that agreement, and it wouldn't have happened, I don't think, without him uh, and w without uh, others that were, were playing that role as well. So, um, so the, the future of, of the U.S. and all of this is, is far from clear. But China is doing a lot of what they're doing for their own, because they've, they've got their own, uh, they recognize it's in their own interest to do this, but they also recognize that it can give them a position internationally that they've never had before, and they can make inroads into places like Africa and uh, other, other parts of the world. And those, you know, the growing influence of China in Africa and other parts of the world could well be to the detriment of, of the U.S. in the long run. These are the, some of the concerns that I have. You want to take it over, Pete? No, it's really, it's interesting. I mean, you've hit on one of the hardest issues. Anytime it's a Tragedy of the global commons problem here in international relations, it's very difficult, right? No one wants to shoulder a disproportionate amount of the burden. And then you have to have a big debate about how much everyone's responsible. You can do it by historical emissions. You could argue by per, per capita emissions, by which standards, you know, France is much cleaner than China. Uh, 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 you can argue by levels of wealth. I mean, is it really? Is it just that you know we have greater wealth, and as Chinese get wealthier, they're gonna the wealth you know they're gonna pollute more too because they're gonna have access to more energy, and also there's the fundamental point that you said in the beginning, which is there's a basic there's got to be a basic human understanding that people need access to electricity, and historically, that meant in its early stage to fossil energy. I mean it's how again we we developed that way. I think to get at those those core issues, you have to develop other viable solutions so that countries see and want an alternative pathway. And it's not going to be forced upon them. Um, I think you know, that was kind of the, the core of the Paris model, where all countries put in targets that they believed were good for themselves, that they wanted to achieve. And I think at, you know, in the immediate aftermath of the election, when Xi Jinping uh, went to Davos and was sort of uh, the questions were coming in about what will happen if, if the United States leaves the Paris Agreement. And he, and 
their position has been, we, we like our, we want to do what we want to do. We want 20% of our energy by 2030 to come from zero carbon energy sources. We, that's a goal for us. Now, do we think countries should honor their international obligations? Yes. But they figured out a way to match their domestic priorities with helping to solve this global good, or create this global good. Will it be fast enough? You know, not, not right away. Will they have to do more? But that's, that's the balance you have to strike. Um, and I think if you, if you ask countries to just agree to something that's well beyond what they want to do, they can write it down on paper, but then you end up in a situation where countries aren't going to do it. So finding that point was, was, I think, the equilibrium that was struck in the Paris Agreement, and I hope we can retain some of that going forward. Let me say a couple of other things, too. My understanding is that one of the biggest uh, problems in Paris was India. And, uh, and so this related very much to how do you get a refrigerator or electricity yeah. to all of the, the people in India in a reasonable fashion. And the cheapest way they saw was, was fossil fuels. And so the question then is, can there be a technology transfer of some sort that enables them to jump, to enable um, solar power? Uh, and this is, this is very much an issue in, in Africa as well. So this is one of the things which, which Pete didn't mention is the creation of this thing called the Green Climate Fund. The Green Climate Fund is one where the wealthier nations who have borne the responsibility for this problem put funds in to enable uh, adaptation, to build resilience by the smaller countries, the, the uh, small island states that are threatened by sea level rise and by, by hurricanes and so on. And President Obama committed the U.S. to $3 billion uh, for that fund. He has put $1 billion into that fund in order to, and so this comes out of the State Department, this is one of the big targets of the Trump administration, and it's unlikely, I think, that the other $2 billion are going to show up uh, in, into that fund. But this is where the U.S. now uh, uh, back, backs away from some of the things it's really supposed to do and really has a moral and ethical responsibility to do, in my view, to help other nations uh, become more, uh, less coal dependent and uh, able to bring electricity to their people without jeopard jeopardizing the whole planet. Great, thank you. Coming out from these panel presentations as well as the discussion is a theme of balance and imbalance. Oftentimes when we think about climate change, we can think about it in the, in the way that the Earth is trying to reestablish a kind of equilibrium right, through the different storms that we're seeing, different wildfires, all the different atmospheric transport anomalies that are taking place. And I wonder if, and we, as we think about the presentations and the imbalances in negotiations taking place internationally, the imbalances in heat, the imbalances in um, emissions and off-gassing, how can we reestablish some of those equilibriums? What are the leverage points? And this question is for all of you. And perhaps we could start with Kim. What are the main leverage points that you believe we can secure to be able to restore balance in society as well as with our, with our climate science? Me, Mercedes. <laughs> I mean, when I look out and see all of you, I feel like it's local action that really gets the ball rolling. The more that we can do, the more that we can demonstrate that things are possible, the more that we can send a message of hope, um, that we can influence and be and leaders for other communities across Colorado and the West. Um, I think just building the, continuing to build the local momentum despite what happens higher up, I think it's really important for us to do that. And I would say that would be, you know, rem remembering that we have a role in this and we, we can be leaders. Go ahead, Kevin. I have solar panels on the roof of my house. But, um, and, you know, Colorado has a lot of sunshine. I want to, everybody can use solar uh, in a way. How many of you have a clothesline and use it? You know, you, you, run, you, run your, you, you run your... your uh, <laughs> 
So, so you know, the, the cost of a dryer and in terms of energy and, and, and also in cost in terms of dollars is quite high. And it takes a little bit of effort to hang clothes on a clothesline, but you can use solar power that way very easily, even if you don't have, have solar panels. You know, I, I, I think there's certainly a lot of things that, that people can do. So one, I, one you should put on your list is, is having a clothesline. Clothesline, you know, people, people object. There are HOAs that have clotheslines are forbidden. They actually, in, in the, the state of Colorado, in its wisdom, uh, passed a law which said you cannot forbid having clotheslines. But, you know, clotheslines are environmentally beautiful, even if the next door neighbor's got their undies hanging on the clothesline, you know. <laughs> so, but, you know, the, the real way to do this is, is very much related to the, the economics. And this relates to the subsidies that exist for fossil fuels right now in many ways, and those are being lowered right now by the Trump administration, the access to to, to um, uh, uh, national lands, uh, the fees are being lowered uh, to, to companies. Um, the, the real way to do this is probably through some kind of a price on carbon, in particular a carbon tax. And if this is implemented in the proper manner, and that's what a politician really ought to do, is to deal with the implementation of it in a proper manner, which means gradually. And so, you know, the best example I can come up with is, is a gas tax. You know, why hasn't the gas tax gone up, for heaven's sakes? You know, we've had, we've had prices as high as $4 a gallon, and, uh, you know, my, my, what I reckon we should do is put a, a, a penny a gallon gas tax on every month. All right? You wouldn't even notice it, right? And after a year, it's, it's 12 cents, a gas tax. And it would help the infrastructure, all of the roads, all of the things that, that Trump says he wants to actually do. And after two years, it's, it's of order a quarter. You know, after 10 years, um, it's uh, $1.20. <coughs> Even that is small compared with the fluctuations that we've had. But what happens if you, put, if you put that in place? Suddenly, the next time you buy your car, you think twice. You think, ah, I'm going to buy a more fuel-efficient car. I'm going to get an electric car. And that puts pressure on the automobile manufacturers, who suddenly start generating much more fuel-efficient cars. And they've got capabilities of doing that. They know how to do this. But there's a little bit of a cost to, to, to dealing with this. I went to uh, a big um, engineering meeting uh, to talk about climate change with them. And, and these were all the engineers, the people who, who uh, make all of the engines and the transmissions and so on. And they said, we can make much more fuel efficient transmissions and bearings and so on, but it costs a bit more. And will the public pay that? Because they can't see it. And so, uh, and so there are capabilities of doing this thing and that relates very much to putting the right incentives in place. And the big part of the incentives relate to things like the gradual implementation of a, of a carbon tax. And that would bring the private sector on board in ways that I think amazing things could happen with, with regard to fuel efficiencies and way of, ways of outfitting uh, current buildings to become more fuel efficient and so on, if the incentives are there. And so th this, is, this is what I would like to see happen. Thank you. How about you, Pete? Any leverage points? to consider? Uh -huh. I was saying um, thank you to you. And for Pete, any leverage points to consider? I don't know if I have a, you know, a perfect answer. I do think that there's a, there is, the market has evolved so much in the favor of clean energy in the last eight years that we're in a much better place to be uh, still excited about the prospects of where we could get to than I would have been. I mean, there's 30 times as much solar capacity in this country as there was eight years ago. Um, uh, you know, emissions in this country have fallen 10% and electricity prices have fallen 10% since 2008. Um, there's, you know, breakthroughs in battery technology happening and it's all over the world. And I think that the market incentives are there. I, you know, to me, one of the frustrating things is I think that this is something that companies will continue to pursue in China and elsewhere, that there is market opportunity and it's going to be a competition to see who, who actually captures this market. And I think that 
when you, by dismantling the incentive structure, we, we are only going to make it easier for other countries to happily, in their businesses, to happily come and try to, try to, try to win that share of the, of, the, of the market, so that when it does come time, when people are incentivized and they do want to buy those clean energy technologies for their homes, you know, they're, they're, it's, I think we're putting ourselves, that's the competitive disadvantage I worry about, not are we trying to build too clean of an economy. Thank you very much. It sounds as if many of those uh, components that you're bringing up could also help to restore a balance of power, right, at that, from that local level all the way up across communities as well. Economically, we could probably agree there's a little bit of an imbalance there as well. So some of those components of incentivizing things, subsidizing the right things, could get us to a more appropriate place of power, you know, putting it in the right hands. Great. I've got one more question. And this one is for Kim. And then we're going to open it right up to you all. I know. I know. Ansi, right? You really want to ask. OK. We've got one more for you, Kim. We talked about local manifestations, things that we're seeing right now with regard to our local environment and how we're seeing climate change happen around us. How do you remain an agent of hope despite these challenges right in your midst? How, do, how does she remain an agent of hope despite living in a place where the climate change is so, so visible? Well, what's the alternative? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could go home and be very depressed, but that's no fun to live life that way. Um, you know, I'm inspired by all the beauty around all of us and the reasons we all live here and all the great work that our community does. I feel very grateful to work where I do and, and volunteer and support the community in the ways that I do. So I just, you just have to stay hopeful because you don't want to be depressed, right? You only have one life to live. so. That's the way I see it. Great. A round of applause for, for our panelists in this little discussion. All right, so get those hands ready to be raised. So we can raise hands, we can stand up. We will, um, I'll do my best to repeat the question to the panel to make sure that they do hear you. We're also gonna do our best to keep our questions as actual questions and be able to share the floor as much as we can because a lot of hands just went up. So we're gonna start with this uh, young lady here in the front. I'm, I'm from New Zealand. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know whether it's still the case or not, but New Zealand actually had more, the only country in the world that had more methane emissions than carbon dioxide emissions. And uh, when I went to school, uh, or when, when I went to college, meth in New Zealand had some 70 million sheep. Now I think it's about 40 million, so it's gone down, but their cattle has gone up. So they also have uh, 10 million cattle or more. Uh, and, and so it relates, actually most of the methane is belched out rather than coming out of the, the backside. But uh, uh, there's been actually quite a lot of work done on on trying to uh, improve or change the food or the, the food mix and cut down on those kind of emissions. But probably uh, a bigger source of, of methane emissions, methane is also called marsh gas. And so it comes from rice paddies. And so in, in Asia, for instance, a lot of methane comes out of, uh, out of, out of that region. How many of you have, a, uh, have had a compost heat, a heap? Have you ever used a compost heap? You know, if you have a compost heap and you put all of your vegetation matter in there and, and it's a really healthy heap, it, it heats up, uh, the, 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 comp the, the vegetation matter decays very rapidly and it mostly generates carbon dioxide. But if it gets wet, unduly wet, uh, then you have a different bacterial action uh, and, uh, it, it, uh, and you tend to form methane and it gets slimy and it stinks and, and, and you can have, it's, it's not a healthy uh, compost heap. But this is what is happening around the planet, in, in, in particular in the northern regions, especially with melting, uh, thawing permafrost and, uh, and, and regions like that, uh, bogs. Uh, there's a generation of, of, there's a tremendous amount of carbon in the soils and, and there's amount, uh, and whether it generates carbon dioxide or methane depends on, uh, often on, on how wet it is. Um, and um, 
Methane is about 28 to 35 times per molecule uh, more, uh, more potent than carbon dioxide. And so it's a very important greenhouse gas in, in, in that regard. Uh, however, the lifetime of methane is about 10 years. But what happens to methane? It gets oxidized and it ends up as carbon dioxide um, in, in practice. And, and so, uh, so methane certainly is very important and there are a number of strategies for cutting down on uh, the methane uh, generation. Uh, there's certainly quite a bit of research, as I say, in New Zealand to cut down on the emissions from cattle and, and, and sheep uh, and so on. Um, some of it's probably unavoidable, um, but uh, you know, again, the same thing with rice paddies. Can you uh, develop uh, rice that doesn't have to have all of this water lying around in the same way? Um, so it's an interesting scientific problem from that standpoint. Thank you for your question. Yes, right there in the... How did the body, the European Union body, perform as a whole with regard to Kyoto and Paris agreements? Very good question. And for, for, you know, for, for the Europeans, uh, the Kyoto Protocol was a comfortable political arrangement. You know, they were able to enter into it. They had and have a comprehensive European trading system that gives them the you know that is very much in line with their commitments in Kyoto. Uh, so the and they had the politics of being in the Kyoto Protocol were broadly positive. The challenge for them was the fact that we weren't part of it, and that was a real source of you know consternation for them because they without the United States involved, which in turn meant it may it and, and with all of the major developing countries not, in, not involved, you ended up with a dwindling share year after year of, co of total emissions actually covered by the Kyoto Protocol. Um, and so when it came time to try to develop a new agreement that could accommodate the United States, they were very supportive of it. They wanted, they wanted, they wanted a comprehensive agreement. One of the things that was always really challenging is for them entering into a legally binding agreement was always really important. The idea that these targets were, you know, had this special quality uh, was, was always something they really valued. They, their argument was, you know, how are you going to, that, that, that's your guarantee for certainty. And, you know, it's an interesting case and we'll never really, it's, 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 I think it's a theoretical argument, but the question is, do you get, what do you get by making, these, making all these targets legally binding? Uh, in the United States, what, what that means is you need something that would get two-thirds of our Senate to agree to it. So you have a political question is, do you want something that, that two-thirds of our Senate can agree to? Will you get that kind of agreement? Secondly, does, does setting legal, what, what kind of enforcement do you have behind a legally binding agreement? Imagine a world in which uh, Europe overshot its Kyoto Protocol commitment. What kind of legal enforcement would you imagine would happen? Would, would the international community be able to exert on it? Would they want to agree to automatic economic penalties, other kinds of sanctions on themselves? That would be their choice. And then finally, the question is, do you promote more or less ambition? Because a country, if they know that there's penalties for failure to, to meet your goal, does that make you want to choose a goal you can kind of walk, sleepwalk into? Is that a danger? Or do you say, well, okay, maybe you get a more modest goal, but there's sort of extra, you know, extra push to join. You know, you, and, and I think that Europe, again, they're a very uh, constructive and critical part of getting the Paris Agreement. For them, I think a challenging thing was being willing to put aside the notion that these targets are internationally legally uh, binding in the way that the Kyoto Protocol targets were. Can I make a couple of comments here as of well? Of course. Um, you know, uh, around 1990 or thereabouts, the, the Europe as a whole uh, and the US were comparable in terms of their overall contributions to carbon dioxide accumulations uh, in the atmosphere. 
And of course we have similar lifestyles and standards of living, uh, but because they went into the Kyoto Protocol, by 2005 or thereabouts, the emissions per capita in Europe were about half what they were in the US. And uh, at that, uh, 1990, the Chinese were about 1 20th of what the US per capita emissions were. Uh, and by 2005, they're up to about, uh, I don't know, a fifth or something like that. And now they're almost comparable. Uh, and given the large number of people in China, that's, uh, that's pretty horrific. But, uh, you know, the, Europe played a major role in, in uh, lowering emissions per capita uh, as a part of the Kyoto Agreement, but the U.S. didn't, didn't go along with it. Now, one of the things that has developed is that, you know, within NOAA, there is a, a, a part of NOAA in the research part, which is apt to be cut, um, targeted, uh, where they monitor carbon dioxide around the world. And in addition, there is a satellite in space called OCO2, the uh, uh, Carbon Observatory, volume version two, because the first one ended up in the Pacific Ocean, uh, that is actually able to track uh, carbon dioxide concentrations around the world and can be a part of the validation process as to whether countries uh, and industries and so on are actually stepping up and uh, agree, uh, meeting their agreements in terms of the carbon dioxide emissions. And, and so you can actually point fingers uh, at these things, but you know, how you deal with that and whether there's any penalties attached to that is, a, is a, another problem. Thank you for your question. Other one? Right here in the plaid? Thank you for your question. I'll just rephrase it and try to capture everything that you said. All good points. I'll just try and uh, rephrase it and capture all of it to give it to the panelists. Thank you. Very good points that you made. So he's, he's asking about in what, if you can address the idea that the industrial feedlots that we have around the world are contributing more methane than transportation combined. And then additionally, the rate of deforestation that's taking place, Southeast Asia, Latin America, by cutting down that rainforest to plant for palm oil plantations or to plant grasses and um, uh, make way for pastures for more animals that then feed us, that then produce more methane. How does this tie in with this discussion of climate change? I think that the, on the first one, I think you're right. There is a huge, it is a huge source. Uh, food production is absolutely a huge source of emissions. I think that that particular report was considering the full suite of inputs that go into the food supply chain. Everything from the, the fossil fuel use in, in fertilizers that are part of the, of, the produ of, of, uh, of the global supply chain to even getting those foods into the marketplace around the world. I think that's how you get to a number that is bigger than the transportation sector. But, it, but by no means does that mean that it's, it's not a hugely consequential part of the overall uh, emissions challenge. Uh, Kevin talked a little bit about how the role of, of, of methane emissions from rice paddy fields already were contributing to that issue as part of that intersection of food production and, 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 and greenhouse gas emissions. I don't know a huge deal about Indonesian politics on this, but maybe you do. I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I can't. I don't have those numbers at my yeah. fingertips. I mean, there are other things that can be said with regard to cutting down rainforest and, and so on. Um, one of the other ways, one of the other things about cutting down rainforest is that they've grown increasing amounts of sugarcane. And the sugarcane is used then to generate ethanol. And so Brazil uh, uses ethanol to, um, instead of petroleum products, to uh, fuel most of their vehicles. Uh, I don't know what that number is, but th that's one of the things that they have done. The trouble is a lot of it is not really very sustainable because growing um, sugarcane is very destructive of the soils, and that's why they have to keep cutting down more rainforest to move on to the next piece of uh, ground because it, it takes so much out of the soils. And so this raises the whole issue 
of whether these practices are, are sustainable. You know, we have other practices in the United States where we, uh, where we grow corn to generate ethanol, and that's a really marginal practice. The, the gain, the net gain is, is, is very marginal when you consider uh, everything that goes into to growing that corn. Um, there is also talk about uh, you know, growing trees as a renewable uh, form of energy, and there's a lot of uh, tree um, pellet, pellets that are generated and even exported from the U.S. Uh, to Europe. And, and so the claim then is that by burning these, they're actually using a renewable fuel rather than a fossil fuel. And, uh, and there's some truth to that, but there's also people who, who, who really don't like that practice in, in, in many respects. And, um, and so, uh, so, so these kind of things come into play as well. Um, the, the problem with the, the, the cattle and so on is that we need food of, of some sort or the other. So it's, it's very hard to you know, I, don't, I don't think everyone's going to go vegetarian, although, as, uh, as uh, uh, Kim said before, uh, you know, if you adjust your diet somewhat, you may be able to make some differences. Thank you for your question. And let's jump to the other side, and then we'll come back in the back there in the pink. You're oh, and I'll just repeat that really quickly for everybody. Um, She's asking again about methane emissions, but in particular with the melting that's taking place of the permafrost in the Arctic, and that despite attempts to mitigate CO2 emissions, that the rate at which the permafrost is melting is going to surpass anything that we individually can do with regard to CO2. Yeah, I can comment a little bit about that. You've probably seen pictures of, of people or scientists who go up into the Arctic and in the vicinities of the permafrost, and they stick a stick something in the ground, and the, and they generate a hole, and then uh, take a match, and 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 they can light it. And there's this little uh, gas jet that that comes out, and it's it's methane, and so the soils underneath the, the permafrost, uh, you know, so this is especially true in seasonal permafrost. Uh, so some of that thaws and and then refreezes. Um, but overall, the, the permafrost is indeed thawing and exposing uh, the potential for more methane to be generated, although it does depend on, as I say, if, if you end up with a bog, uh, how, whether or not that dries out and you can get the kind of bacterial action that end up generating carbon dioxide rather than methane. And I don't think scientists know exactly how much of this is a problem. It's certainly a, got the potential to act as a, what we call a positive feedback to amplify uh, the problems uh, as you start to uh, thaw the permafrost uh, at, at high latitudes. Uh, and so it is a concern, but I don't know that there's a full appreciation for just how much uh, that is a, a major problem or, or a minor problem. Thank you for your question. Step back to the side, yes, in the orange coat. Modeling the climate what? I'll just uh, rephrase the question there. Thank you so much for it. Uh, the initial question was to Kevin. On, in your modeling processes, are you modeling climate refugees? And then the second part of the question goes to Pete. And how, is, how can that affect international policy and potentially be a leverage point for our current administration? At, at, NCAR, at NCAR, we have gone from uh, what we called a, a climate and a global climate model to uh, an Earth system model. And the Earth system model has increasingly included all aspects of the biogeochemical cycles. That we have a group at NCAR which is actually dealing with the role of humans. And so this deals with issues relating to, to population and the food that they eat and, and uh, so on. Some of these questions can be addressed by, uh, through scientific means, but there's a, a lot of issues when you start talking about people that are completely chaotic and, 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 and unpredictable. Um, you know, who could, who could have predicted the outcome of the George W. Bush versus Al Gore 
uh, vote in the Supreme Court. It, you know, if it went one way, you have one outcome, and, and another way, you have a different outcome. And, and so there's a lot of unpredictable aspects that are not very amenable to scientific treatment, but we are aware of these kind of things, and some parts of it we deal with. And so it does, one, but certainly one of the outcomes of this that social scientists worry about is, uh, are the environmental refugees. And, uh, and I was involved uh, just a little while ago uh, and in, uh, at the War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, which, is, which had a whole lot of high-level generals, including four-star generals there, who are very, very worried about the destabilizing aspects of climate change on exacerbating the, the conflicts and the problems are around the world. Uh, and, and so climate change is very much a, a problem that the military worry about uh, a great deal, and it's very much because of uh, the increases in refugees, and, and climate change has played a role already, we know, in, in, uh, in Syria and, and the Sudan and in the Middle East. Uh, you know, who's got control of the water? It, often it's, it's regarded as a, perhaps a secondary issue, but it, it is an issue and it's exacerbated the nature of those conflicts. Uh, just to add on that, I mean, I think you're right that there's a broad, I think that in the policy making world, in the foreign policy world, the intelligence community, national, the Pentagon, there's a sort of a broad recognition that environmental, been very explicit in all of their planning documents that, you know, environmental factors and climate change are potentially huge, you know, threat multipliers. Um, I think often the, the challenge, and have tried to wrestle with it, and, and I think are becoming increasingly sophisticated as the science improves and becomes more and more you know, uh, uh, able to help to pre make better predictions about what kind of environment we're gonna be operating in, I think it'll increase. I think the challenge is all these problems are so overdetermined. I mean, well, migration is driven by such a myriad of factors that it's, it's, I think it's essential and you do yourself a huge disservice, which is why People want to try to factor in the environmental considerations, but obviously it is one of a, of a kind of whole network of challenges that come together around these problems. But I do think that you're going to get, you know, there's more and more of an understanding about the role they play, and, I, and hopefully we'll be able to inform decision making at the kind of more operational level. Thank you very much for those responses, and thank you very much for your attendance, for your patience, for your questions, for your attention. Let's give a round of applause to Kevin Trenberg, Pete Ogden, and Kimberly Langmaid. And now Chris will close us out here. Thanks, everybody. Obviously, there are a lot more questions, and I wish we could get into them. Some of you may be able to come up and talk with the panelists for a few minutes before you leave. Obviously, a, a topic that's very timely, and I think we'll be looking at it from the Vail Symposium to say, what can we do on this topic again next year so that we can address some other things and you can get some more of your questions answered. Um, I, one of the things I love about the symposium is we had Amory Lovins here uh, in January talking about disruptive energy futures, which was a perfect tie into this. And if you can't take, I, I wanna take Kim's uh, approach, which is that you don't wanna be depressed. If you do wanna be depressed, in April, we have a program on the nuclear threat. So, Come back and hear that because that's also a very topical uh, issue for us. Thanks again. Be careful going home.